I want to invite you to take your Bible this morning and join me in the shortest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 117. Psalm 117. The subject this morning is the little mission psalm glorious displayed in the life of John Gibson Patton, missionary to the cannibals. Psalm 117, two verses, hear the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Charles Spurgeon called John Patton the, quote, king of the cannibals. Such is an appropriate and accurate description of this brave missionary who risked his life and sacrificed a great deal that the tribes of murderous cannibals in the New Hebrides Islands might praise the Lord for his steadfast love and his faithfulness that endures for generations. As far as we know, the New Hebrides, uh, now known as Vanuatu, had no Christian influence before John Williams and John Harris from the London Missionary Society who landed there in 1839. Both of these missionaries were killed and eaten by cannibals on the island of Eromanga on November the 20th of that year, only minutes after they had gone ashore. 48 years later, John Patton would write, quote, thus were the New Hebrides baptized with the blood of martyrs. And Christ thereby told the whole world that he claimed these islands as his own. In his classic book on missions, Let the Nations Be Glad, John Piper notes, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate and not man. These words, I think, capture well what Psalm 117 is all about. It is about missions to the nations who do not worship God in order that they might rightly worship Him. As I noted a moment ago, Psalm 117 is the shortest psalm in the Psalter and also the shortest psalm in all, or shortest chapter in all of the Bible. And yet again, Charles Spurgeon is exactly right when he says, this psalm, which is very little in its letter, is exceedingly large in its spirit. For bursting all bounds of race or nationality, it calls upon all mankind to praise the name of the Lord. Martin Luther, the great reformer, loved the psalm and wrote a 36-page commentary on it. That is, by the way, 18 pages per verse. Uh, Psalm 117 is also a part of a half a dozen of psalms, Psalm 113 through 118, known as the Egyptian halo. These six psalms were sung as the Hebrews gathered to celebrate the Passover, God's great act of deliverance on behalf of the nation of Israel. Psalm 113 and 114 were sung before the memorial meal, and Psalm 115 through 118 were sung afterwards. Uh, In context, Jesus and his disciples would have sung these very psalms on the night they celebrated the Passover, and just before his betrayal and arrest, Matthew 26, verse 30, and Mark chapter 14, verse 26. Psalm 117 is anonymous, and it is the fifth of the Egyptian or Exodus Hallels. It is international in scope and reveals for us the heart of our God toward the nations. Verse 2 makes it very clear. He loves the nations. And verse 1 is also equally clear. He desires that all the nations would worship him. It's interesting to note that the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 15 and verse 11 cites this very verse as evidence of God's redemptive love and the fact that his redemptive purpose always included the nations, just like he promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now, this is what I hope to do in my few moments this morning. I want to bring you, first of all, a brief biography of this wonderful missionary hero, John Patton. I will then follow an expository pattern through the two verses of Psalm 117 and show you how particular aspects of John Patton's life and writings wonderfully match up with this little psalm. And so, first of all, a word of biography. Patton wrote of his own life and his aspirations for his children when he said, and I quote, let me record my immovable conviction 
that this is the noblest service in which any human being can spend or be spent. And that if God gave me back my life to be lived over again, I would, without one quiver of hesitation, lay it all on the altar to Christ. That he might use it as before in similar ministries of love, especially among those who have never yet heard the name of Jesus. Nothing that has been endured and nothing that can now befall me makes me tremble. On the contrary, I deeply rejoice when I breathe the prayer that it may please the blessed Lord to turn the hearts of all my children to the mission field and that he may open up their way and make it their pride and joy to live and die in carrying Jesus and his gospel into the heart of the heathen world. By the way, just a quick word. It's one thing for you to pray about going to the nations. It's something altogether different when it comes to your children. And it's even something greater than that to pray that prayer for your grandchildren. And yet here is a man of God that gladly would give his children to the cause of world missions because of his great love for the gospel and Jesus Christ. Now you might ask, how could he write words like this? And I believe it was because his soul was gripped by an unalterable conviction. I quote, whatever trials have befallen me in my earthly pilgrimage, I have never had the trial of doubting that perhaps, after all, Jesus had made some mistake. mistake. No, my blessed Lord Jesus makes no mistakes. When we see all this meaning, we shall then understand what now we can only trustfully believe that all is well, best for us, best for the cause most dear to us, best for the good of others and the glory of God. John Patton was born in Scotland on May the 24th, 1824. He sailed for the New Hebrides via Australia with his wife Mary on April the 16th, 1858. He was at that time 33 years of age. They reached the island of Tanna on November the 5th, but in March of the next year, both his wife and his newborn son died of fever. He would serve alone on the island for the next four years under constant danger. He was eventually forced to leave the island in February of 1862, leaving he felt that he had been a terrible failure. He married again in 1864 and took his wife Margaret back to the New Hebrides. This time they went to a smaller island, Aniwa. It was, by the way, only about seven miles by two miles. They would labor on that island for the next 41 years until Margaret died in 1905 when John Patton was 81. The natives of Aniwa were cannibals, and often they would eat the flesh of their defeated foes. They also practiced infanticide, widow sacrifice, killing the widows of deceased men so that they could serve their husbands in the next world. Thinking about what he was encountering, Patton would write, their worship was entirely a service of fear, its aim being to propitiate this or that evil spirit, to prevent calamity or to secure revenge. They deified their chiefs so that almost every village or tribe had its own sacred man. They exercised an extraordinary influence for evil. These village or tribal priests and they were believed to have uh, at their disposal life and death through their sacred ceremonies. They also worshiped the spirit of departed ancestors and heroes though their material, through their material idols of wood and stone. They feared the spirits and sought their aid, especially seeking to propitiate those who preside over war and peace, famine and plenty, health and sickness, destruction and prosperity, life and death. Their whole worship was one of slavish fear. And so far as I could ever learn, they had no idea of a God of mercy or grace. Many times in his autobiography, Patton admitted that he wondered if these people would ever be brought to the point of believing and trusting in Christ. Still, he pressed forward learning the language and reducing it to writing. Uh, he built orphanages and loved these orphanages. He said, we trained these young people for Jesus. 
We trained the teachers and we translated and printed and expounded the scriptures, ministered to the sick and dying, dispensing medicines every day and taught them the use of tools. In the next 15 years, John and Margaret Patton saw the entire island of Aniwa turn to faith in Jesus Christ. Later he would write, I claimed Aniwa for Jesus. And by the grace of God, Aniwa now worshiped at the Savior's feet. In 1897, he published the New Testament in the Aniwa language. Even to his death, he was translating hymns and catechisms and creating a dictionary for his people, even though he was unable to be with them any longer. During his years of labor on the island, Patton kept a journal and notebooks and letters from which he wrote his massive autobiography in three parts from 1887 to 1898. Patton would outlive his second wife by just two years. He would die in Australia on January the 28th, 1907. Today, 85% of the population of Vanuatu identifies itself as Christian. 20% proudly identify themselves as evangelicals. The sacrifices and legacy of this missionary to the New Hebrides are really difficult to put into words. I'll simply summarize it this way. Our great God did a great work in and through this man that the people of Aniwa would praise the Lord for his steadfast love and his faithfulness that endures forever. So let us move to the text and let me make two simple and overarching observations from God's word this morning. Number one, the Lord is to be magnified above, above, among the nations. Verse one, praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. Psalm 117 follows what we call a command reason pattern. We are told what to do in verse one. We are told why we do it in verse 2. Furthermore, both verses follow classic Hebrew parallelism because we see that the second line in each verse reinforces the first line. Furthermore, the psalm opens and closes with the same word, praise or hallelujah. Psalm 117 then is clearly a universal invitation to people everywhere to praise and to also extol the Lord because of, verse 2, his steadfast love and uh, his faithfulness. In other words, the psalmist is simply saying to us today, no God is like our God. This God and this God alone is worthy to be praised. Now, verse 1 can be studied or broken down into two simple parts. Number 1, God desires that all the nations would praise him. The psalm begins with a call to praise the Lord. Roland Allen notes quite well, praise is a choice, not a feeling. We are not to praise the Lord only when we feel warm and fuzzy inside. We are to praise him even in our most troubled moments, for even during those times, he is still our God. So the psalm begins, praise the Lord, all nations. But then what follows can only be described as an unexpected surprise. Normally, it is the people of God, the community of faith, Israel, who are called to praise the Lord, but not here. No, it is the goin. It is the nations as it's rendered in multiple English translations. A nations does not refer to political states, but people groups a different ethnic and linguistic groups. And just to keep you up to date, as of August of this year, the Joshua Project informs us that there are approximately 17,000 different people groups in the world today. 7,085 still remain unreached. When you add all of those together, that means even today, in August of 2018, 3.1% Four billion people still have either no access to the gospel or very limited access to the gospel. In other words, amazingly, in 2018, there are places where you and I could go, be dropped by a helicopter or parachute, hit the ground, start walking. We would never see a church and we would never meet a Christian. And yet the Bible is crystal clear that God desires all of these peoples, all of these nations would praise him. 
But secondly, God also desires that all the nations would extol him. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all people. The word extol means to boast. Uh, it means to praise. It has, though, the idea uh, of bragging on someone. It means to, to make much of someone. In other words, our God is to be shown by his people to be great, to be good, and to be awesome. As one man says, we are to gossip in a good way about the great God that we know, the great God that we love, the great God we worship, and the great God that we serve. And we are to do it among all the peoples. Of course, the word peoples like nations refers to ethnic, language, and cultural groupings of people. Uh, in our modern vernacular, we might perhaps uh, appreciate mostly the word tribes. It kind of captures quite well what we're talking about. And no, this word people is not singular. It is in the plural. It, by the way, occurs more than 230 times like this in the ESV. In other words, tribes live around the world, but also down the street. There are people who share, wherever they are, a common language, a common culture, common interests, common ideals and values. So whether they are a mile away or whether they're 10,000 miles away, they need to know and hear about the God, the only God, who is worthy of praise and worthy of glory. A passion then for the praise of this great God among all the peoples we discover was planted very early in the heart of John Patton, and he was made this way by the Lord through the ministry and love of mission-minded parents. In fact, in one particular section of his autobiography, he explains this with crystal clear clarity. I quote, My dear Green Street people, this was, by the way, a church that he served for a number of years in Scotland before going to the New Hebrides. My dear Green Street people grieved excessively at the thought of my leaving them, and daily they pled with me to remain. Indeed, the opposition was so strong from nearly all, and many of them warm Christian friends, that I was sorely tempted to question whether I was carrying out the divine will or only some headstrong wish of my own. Some retorted upon me, uh, there are heathen at home. Uh, let us seek and save, first of all, the lost ones perishing at our doors. This I felt to be most true and an appalling fact, but I unfailingly observed that those who made this retort neglected these home heathen themselves, and so the objection as from them lost all of its power. By the way, if you hear that same junk from people in your church, you ignore it too. If they're not giving, if they're not going, if they're not sharing, pay them no mind. In fact, in a non-spiritual moment, just tell them to shut up. <laughs> I move on. They would ungrudgingly spend more on a fashionable party at dinner or tea, on concert or ball or theater, or on some ostentatious display or worldly and selfish indulgence Ten times more, perhaps in a single day, than they would give in a year or in half a lifetime for the conversion of the whole heathen world, either at home or abroad. Objections from all such people must, of course, always count for nothing among men to whom spiritual things are realities. For these people themselves, I do and always did only pity them as God's stewards making such a miserable use of time and money entrusted to their care. On meeting them with so many obstructing influences, I again laid the whole matter before my dear parents, and their reply was to this effect. Now listen very quick, carefully what his mom and dad said to him. Heretofore we feared to bias you, but now we must tell you why we praise God for the decision to which you have been led. Your father's heart was set upon being a minister, but other claims forced him to give it up. When you were given to them, your father and mother laid you upon the altar, their firstborn, to be consecrated, if God saw fit, as a missionary of the cross. And it has been their constant prayer that you might be prepared, qualified, and led to this very decision. And we pray with all our heart that the Lord may accept your offering, long spare you, 
and give you many souls from the heathen, heathen world for your hire. From that moment, every doubt as to my path of duty forever vanished. I saw the hand of God very visibly, not only preparing me for, but now leading me to the foreign mission field. Thus, it is no surprise that as a young boy, Patton sensed the call to be a missionary, and speaking specifically of his father's influence, he would add, as we rose from our knees in prayer, I used to look at the light on my father's face, and I wish I were like him in spirit, hoping that in answers to his prayers, I might be privileged and prepared to carry the blessed gospel to some, to some portion of the heathen world. I have little doubt that it was the spirit of his father that gave John Patton, first of all, the courage to go, but also it gave him the fortitude to stay among the cannibals of the New Hebrides. Let me say a quick word about both. First of all, the courage to go, a very famous story. Pat was once confronted by an older saint who sought to discourage him from going to the New Hebrides, and he chided him with these words, the cannibals, you will be eaten by the cannibals. Patton calmly replied, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. The old gentleman, after hearing this, raised his hands in a deprecating attitude, left the room exclaiming, after that, I have nothing more to say. Good. The, the courage to return and stay. Let me give just one example of the death of his precious 19-year-old wife and his baby boy. Patton writes, In a moment altogether unexpectedly, she died on May, March the 3rd. To crown my sorrows and complete my loneliness, the dear baby boy whom we had named after her father, Peter Robert Robson, was taken from me after one week's sickness on the 20th of March. Let those who have ever passed through any similar darkness as of midnight feel for me. As for all others, it would be more than vain to try to paint my sorrows. He, by the way, would dig two graves with his own hands, bury them right beside the house where he lived, and then he would add this in his autobiography. Stunned by that dreadful loss and entering upon the field of labor to which the Lord had himself so evidently led me, my reason seemed for a time almost to give way. The ever merciful Lord sustained me and that spot became my sacred and much frequented shrine during all the following months and years when I labored on for the salvation of the savage islanders amidst difficulties, dangers, and death. Listen carefully but for Jesus and the fellowship he vouchsafed to me there. I must have gone mad and died beside the lonely grave. Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus was faithful. And so listen again to the heartbroken cries of this wonderful man of God. I felt her loss beyond all conception or description in that dark land. It was very difficult to be resigned, left alone, and in sorrowful circumstances. But feeling immovably assured that my God and Father was too wise and loving to err in anything that he does or permits, I looked up to the Lord for help and struggled on in his work. I do not pretend to see through the mystery of such visitations wherein God calls away the young, the promising, and those sorely needed for his service here. But this I do know and feel that in the light of such dispensations, it becomes all of us to love and serve our blessed Lord Jesus so that we may be ready at his call for death and eternity. Yes, the Lord is to be magnified among the nations. Number two, the Lord is to be magnified because of his nature. Look at verse two. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithless of the Lord, it endures forever. Praise the Lord. 
There's a rhyme and reason to God's call to magnify himself among the nations. It's not arbitrary. It's not whimsical. It's not misplaced. It's not the because I said so of a celestial bully or a capricious deity on a cosmic ego trip. No. It is a call rooted in the very nature and character of God that when rightly understood causes us to rise up and worship him because we must and it causes us to rise up and worship him because we want to. Now what can we say about this great God? Two things are said there in verse 2. One, he is great in his love for us. And two, he will be faithful to love us forever. Verse 2, by the way, is grounded in one of the greatest verses in the Old Testament, one of the greatest verses in the Bible, Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6, where the Bible says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and in truth. And so two quick observations about verse 2. Number one, our God is a God of steadfast love, for great is his steadfast love love it is the beautiful hebrew word hesed hard for us to capture exactly what it means in english hence if you survey a number of english translations you hear the following the new king james version merciful kindness the niv love the new american standard loving kindness the esv steadfast love the christian standard bible faithful love the new living translation unfailing love the thing I would point out is note that his steadfast love is great. That word great is a strong and vigorous word. It's used of the stronger side uh, in a battle or overflowing floodwaters. Uh, ideas like mighty and prevailing capture something of the significance of this rich Hebrew word. Furthermore, in the Hebrew text, it's fronted for emphasis so that literally the verse reads, is mighty over us, his stead." fast love now how do we apply this to god's mission to reach the nations i think we do so in this way missions is telling the nations to praise and extol christ and then giving them the evidence for why they should do so we don't say as we go out to share the gospel just glorify the one true and living christ we give them good biblical and theological reasons why they should and what does verse 2 tell us? Our God is a God of love. He loves you. He loves me. He loves the world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 16 tell us it is the very essence and nature of God's character. Our God is a God of love. And I'm absolutely convinced that had John Patton not known this, he would not have been able to stay there among cannibals on the New Hebrides Islands. Let me give you just one moment when the truth of this verse was especially precious to him when his life was again in danger. Uh, he was being pursued. They were going to kill him. Uh, natives that he could not really trust told him to climb up and hide in a chestnut tree. Uh, he really was at their mercy, and so he had no other recourse than to do what they said. And here's what he described about his spending a night hiding for his life hidden up in a tree. I quote, being entirely at the mercy of such doubtful and vacillating friends, I, though perplexed, felt it best to obey. I climbed into the tree and was left there alone in the bush. The hours I spent there live all before me as if it were but of yesterday. I heard the frequent discharging of muskets and the yells of the savages, yet I sat there among the branches as safe as in the arms of Jesus. Never in all my sorrows did my Lord draw nearer to me and speak more soothingly in my soul than when the moonlight flickered among the chestnut leaves and the night air played on my throbbing brow as I told all my heart to Jesus. Alone, yet not alone. And if it be to glorify my God, I will not grudge to spend many nights alone in such a tree to fill again my Savior's spiritual presence, to enjoy his consoling fellowship, if thus thrown back upon your own soul, alone, all alone, in the midnight, in the bush, in the very embrace of death itself, have you a friend that will not fail you then? And of course the answer is yes, and his name is Jesus. Our God is a God 
of steadfast love. And then finally, our God is a God of faithfulness. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord, it endures forever. In other words, if God's steadfast love is great, his faithfulness is eternal, everlasting. It endures forever. In other words, God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 that all the earth, all the peoples would be blessed by his descendants. From Abraham came Israel. From Israel came Jesus. God kept his word. That word faithless carries the idea of truth or to be firm or unshakable. And I think it's very clear the two ideas are interrelated. If he is always truthful, it is because he is always faithful. And if he is always faithful, it is because he is always truthful. In other words, what God has promised to do for us in Christ is as certain and sure today as on the day that he made them. These truths, again, clearly captured the heart of John Patton and moved him to put all on the line for King Jesus. As I move to close, let me, again, let him speak for himself. Nothing so clears the vision and lifts up the life as a decision to move forward in what you know to be entirely the will of the Lord. By the way, I've said this many, many times. God's will is not always easy. And God's will is not always safe. But God's will, as Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 tells us, it is always perfect. He continues, Our continuous danger calls me now oftentimes to sleep with my clothes on. That I might start at a moment's warning. My faithful dog, Clutha, which he had named after the ship that brought him there, my faithful dog, Clutha, would give a sharp bark and awaken me. God made them fear this precious creature and often used her in saving our lives. I would just simply note very quickly, it was a dog, not a cat. I, um, <laughs> I move on. My enemies seldom slackened their hateful designs against my life, however calmed or baffled for the moment. A wild chief followed me around for four hours with his loaded musket, and though often directed toward me, God restrained his hand. I spoke kindly to him and attended to my work as if he had not been there, fully persuaded that my God had placed me there and would protect me till my allotted task was finished. Looking up then in unceasing prayer to our dear Lord Jesus, I left all in his hands. I felt immortal till my work was done. Trials and hairbreadth escapes strengthened my faith and seemed only to nerve me for more to follow. And this is what followed. When natives in large numbers were assembled at my house, a man furiously rushed on me with his axe, but a Kasaramuni chief snatched a spade with which I had been working and dexterously defended me from instant death. Life in such circumstances led me to cling very near to the Lord Jesus. I knew not for one brief hour when or how attack might be made, and yet, with my trembling hand clasped in the hand once nailed on Calvary, and now swaying the scepter of the universe, calmness and peace and resignation abode in my soul. If you have known better than John Patton, our Lord's great steadfast love and our Lord's faithfulness that endures forever. John Patton's life, I believe, can be best summarized in his own words. He said, God gave his best, his son, to me, and I give back my best, my all, to him. What a wonderful way to think. What a wonderful way to live. What a wonderful way to die. May God, by his grace and for his glory, even among this student body, raise up more John Pattons. So this Charles Spurgeon well said, no one tribe of men shall be underrepresented in the universal song which shall ascend unto the Lord of all forever and ever. Praise the Lord. Several years ago, we became convinced that we needed a new uh, seminary hymn. 
one that reflected the heart and passion of Southeastern Seminary. And uh, Keith and Kristen Getty, dear friends to me and to many others at this school, graciously set about that task, and they penned for us, I think, just the perfect song. So as we are dismissed this morning, we're going to stand, sing this song, close in prayer, and then be dismissed to go out. And like John Patton, trust in the will of the Lord, go wherever it is that God may send us, trusting that until he is through with us, we are immortal. No one can lay a hand to stop us. Let's stand, we sing together.